I mean, how can you survive this way? He said to me, you know, it's been like that for some years. The pain medication don't work. There's nothing that can help. I learned to cope with it. And so we put a patch around, around his hand, put a patch on it, and waited about half an hour. And then we asked him. Uh, he said, wow. He said, oh, interesting. It's about two or three right now. He said, nothing has done that. And I've seen so many cases of people being helped. So many cases, people I know, my friends, and, and all over the world. Even in Australia, there's uh, we had uh, we have some people there who promote hurting, and we had good results. The Jim Ashman published three very uh, interesting paper explaining how the electrons come inside the body. We do know that the best place to be grounded are the feet, and we do know that if we have a meridian there called the kidney one point of the meridian right there in the foot. I think of it all as just, you know, as an engineer, it's all just input signals, right? And we want to give our body the right input signal. If you kind of understand how photons excite electrons, they also transfer the wavelength, the frequency to that electron. So to me, and what a lot of folks in the, the quantum biology space think is they're pretty much just they're quote unquote stealing electrons because we don't we can't utilize them the same. This is Decentralized Radio. I'm Tristan and I'm Ryan. The goal of this podcast is to help educate you on how to live your most optimal life. We will host industry expert guests to shed light on topics that matter. We are not gurus, rather two individuals who have had to pave their own path to health and vitality, independent of the centralized systems that plague modern society. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Decentralized Radio. Today, we have Gaetan oh, Chevy, Chevalier. How, yes, how do Chevalier. I say that? Chevalier. Chevalier. I've, I've, been to, I've been to France a couple of times, but I knew that was going to be challenging for me. So, Gaetan, how's it going? Uh, it's going very well. Thank you. So, I'm really excited for this conversation. Um, Gaetan is kind of the expert researcher uh, in grounding and earthing. We've talked a lot about earthing and grounding benefits on, on this podcast, talk a lot about it on my social media. And Gaetan has his PhD in engineering physics and is a professor at the California Institute of Health Science. And For human science. Really doing some, human science, sorry about that. And is, is doing some great research uh, or has done some great research on, on grounding. So I'm really excited to get into that, but Gaetan, before we do, um, yeah, maybe you could give a, a quick introduction on your background, your evolution, and, and how you kind of discovered maybe more of this bioenergetic, bioelectric side of health and <clears throat> research, because going from engineering physics into you know the biological side of things isn't a common path, really, but it's a fascinating one and one that really makes a lot of sense from the multidisciplinary perspective when you realize how connected everything is. Yeah, and that is the, the key right there, you know, is seeing the connection between everything. So, yeah, after I um, obtained my PhD in engineering physics from the University of Montreal, I went to work for the Tokamak de Varennes in nuclear fusion. A Tokamak de Varennes was, Varennes is a city just south of Montreal, and it was the at the time the um, the location of the largest uh, tokamak in Canada. And what is a tokamak? It's a nuclear fusion machine. The word tokamak is a Russian word, means like donut. So it's a donut shaped device, huge. You know, you can walk inside, and it has it is filled with uh, with gas, uh, hydrogen, isotopes, uh, two of them, um, deuterium and tritium. And they are accelerated at really, really, really high energy. I mean, in terms of temperature, they have to be close to 10 million degrees. That's how high it is. And that's why it's a donut shape because the plasma, you know, is too hot to touch anything. So then at that speed, the, the nucleus fuse and become helium and then energy is produced. And that's what's happening inside the sun. So basically, they're trying to replicate what's inside the sun. Now, the difficulty is to get more energy out of it that you put in, because just to get that, you know, energy, uh, it's a lot of energy. If it, 
to show that's um, you know, energy expenditure. Then um, from there, I was a postdoc there. Then I got a job at UCLA uh, in the mechanical aerospace and nuclear engineering department, working under Bob Kahn. Uh, we were doing simulation of plasma wall interaction. So that means that we were trying, you know, the, this hot plasma in the middle of the tokamak what happened when it hits the walls of the machine. And so that's a big problem. And um, so we were working on the best way of, you know, attenuating that. And then I switched with uh, Professor Chen doing research in, um, in low energy plasma physics, in his low energy plasma physics labs, uh, doing, uh, we're doing research on helicon way, which is a way of creating a plasma we're using um, an, our radio frequency antenna and coupling the almost 100% of the energy into the plasma. Uh, that idea was interested, interesting to Japanese people who actually made a, a big size you know, machine uh, powered by uh, AD Conway. So that was my uh, research at UCLA. But on the side, I was also interested in yoga. Uh, we've done... Uh, um, natural, nat- natural. My, my wife was a student in uh, naturopathic medicine, so we delve into nutrition, yoga, different things. And uh, when I was at um, UCLA, so we were um, also uh, interested in continuing that. So we met some groups, and one of the group uh, had um, a magazine called Share International. And one of the leaders this us came to me and said, look at this research from that Japanese scientist. And it was, uh, uh, his name was Hiroshi Mutoyama. He was a Shinto priest, uh, head of, uh, uh, of, early, uh, of a Shinto faction of religion, if you would call Tamamitsu. And he was doing research on meridian, chakras, all these kind of things. And I got interested into that. And I said, well, with my background in engineering physics and everything, um, it's like your background you, electrical engineering will, would fit perfectly also so I wrote there was um, an address I wrote uh, to Japan not expecting anything saying well, I'd be interested see what you're doing if I can do like a hobby you know try to do something on my side and I got a response a letter came back to me and the, the author said well Dr. Matiyama is coming to Santa Monica for doing mm. A presentation on, uh, and so I guess Santa Monica. I mean, I was at UCLA living just south, you know, a nice place uh, there was called uh, Westwood Village. Really, I like, enjoyed that. I mean, people think LA, you know, it's big traffic and everything, but from Westwood Village, we could buy everything just walking. It was so nice. Anyway, so I went to um, see Dr. Motuyama, listen to a lecture. It was very difficult to understand. His, Type of English I found out later was a mix of Japanese, German, and English. <laughs> and so I guess I was not alone having difficulty understanding what he's saying, but it didn't stop me from going and seeing him after and said to him, you know, do you, what you're doing is very interesting. Is there a way I can, you know, do something, collaborate or help in some ways? And he looked at me and he said, you know, did you teach electricity and magnetism? Um, you know, do you have an experience in that? I was kind of flabbergasted because that's exactly what I was teaching. When I was, when I was a PhD student, to make more um, money, you know, I was teaching uh, electricity and magnetism to the beginners, uh, you know, uh, the, um, the, 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 the students in the bac- bac- baccalaureate mm-hmm. um, degree at uh, Polytechnic. Sometimes I have 75 students in my class. So I said, yes. <laughs> so he said... Uh, Okay, I'm starting a school in uh, in San Diego in Encinitas, and I would like you to. Would you be willing, you know, to teach that class? So I said yes. So the, on Saturdays, I was driving from from Los Angeles to San Di- to uh, actually Encinitas, which is a s- small short town in San Diego County. It was was about two hour drive, and uh, teaching a two hour class and coming back. I've done that for many many months, and uh, I remember I had three students at the time. So I've done that for many, many months. And then after that, Dr. Mutima offered me a full-time position at CIHS. 
I was kind of surprised. And I said, wow, now I have a decision. Um, you know, leaving mainstream science, which was, you know, my career up to now, and going into doing research on meridian chakras, and, which was considered in 1993, you know, woo-woo science was not developed like today. It was like nobody, you know, was really interested. But I knew I had to do it. That was my path. So I decided to accept this, this position, and I went down to CIHS. And I became a director of a couple of programs there. And by the way, the, the, the class that I taught, I started to teach, the first one was in 1992. Fall of 1992 was the first quarter of the school. And the students I was teaching to were the only three students. I found that later. It was like, wow, okay. Anyway, so I was uh, doing research there at CIHS. I was director of research and director of the human science department and the life physics department. I mean, it was a small school, so we had many hats. And suddenly, uh, one time, this person come in. His name is Clint Ober, and mm. he started talking about earthing, nice. grounding. And it was like in 2003, so he had done only one research project with a nurse and it was mainly questionnaires. And so people were asking, you know, pain level, uh, you know, um, headache, uh, all kind of health conditions. And so then they were grounded for uh, sleeping, grounded for some weeks. And then the, then the, they filled the, the questionnaires again. And there were improvement in pain, better sleep, you know, more energy, all this stuff. And I said to myself, was listening to that. And I said to myself, well, you know, this sounds too good to be true. I mean, you just put your feet on the ground and all of this <laughs> happened. It's like, it would have been discovered a, a, a century ago if it was true. And actually it was, I didn't know that, but that's another story. So I said, well, that's okay. I didn't pay attention. I, I continued my things. It, well, I would have left it at that if it was not for one of his associates coming to me as director of research there and saying, we want to pay for a research project. So being an open school ourselves, you know, the school was independent. We were already doing research on some kind of uh, extracurricular, if you will, uh, things like studying the meridians and even the chakras. Um, so we were open to that and said, okay, let's, let's design a research project. So we did it and the results were excellent. So we had different machines to measure heart rate, heart rate variability, muscle tension, brain activity, and a special machine that Dr. Mutima was the inventor to measure the flow of energy in the meridians. And everything showed improvements. We even had a new discovery that actually the muscle are, uh, are also control their tension when you are grounded. They're controlled by the autonomic nervous system. And this control does not exist when you're not control when you're not grounded. That was pretty interesting, and uh, I have theories behind that. It's because you know, I don't know if we have time to get into that. But in, in any case, it, we made new discovery. But I was still skeptical because I said, "Well, the equipment is grounded. The person is grounded. What if we are ground loops and things like that?" Because I had this problem when I was doing my PhD. I was ground loop currents. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, ground loop currents, because I was working with many, many equipment, like powerful lasers and, you know, machines that were making plasma out of zirconium, which is a refractory metal. So we need several machines. All of these machines had to be plugged and grounded at the same ground to function yep. properly. Yeah. So, so I was so wondering about I, I guess for, for those that don't know what ground loop, ground loop currents are, it's when, when you have... Uh, different ground areas. Um, oftentimes, there could instead of one singular earth ground, there can be a current that is generated um, residually. And this is a common problem with with audio applications where you get the static noise on the line. Um, so that's what a, a big concern is for a lot of folks about grounding. Uh, we can get into grounding in cities, grounding in dirty emf areas that's something i want to talk about but i just want to add that quick sort of explanation in before you continue hey friend thanks for listening if you really enjoy this podcast it would be really appreciated if you left us a five-star review on spotify apple 
or subscribe to our content on YouTube. This helps us get to a larger reach and a larger audience to spread this wonderful free education. Okay. Yeah, great. Thank you. I mean, sometimes I don't know, you know, how, how far I should go, but thank you for uh, this uh, clarification. And um, so we decided to replicate the experiment, but with more advanced systems. This time, the system that acquired the data was battery powered and um, the data was transferred to a computer through fiber optics. No possibility of brown loops. And the results were at least as good. And this time, also, I had two friends who participated to um, that project. One of the friends, they both had, interestingly, they both had um, uh, inflammation and uh, arthritis in the, in the hands. Uh, one of them, I remember, we were talking to him and... And we were asking, so how is your pain level right now, you know, on your thumb? He has a thumb problem. He said, well, it's about eight. I mean, you know, that from zero to 10, zero is no pain. 10 is like you can't, can't tolerate it. You're ready to jump off a, a bridge or something. He said, I'm at eight. And I said, wow, we're at eight. It doesn't even show. I mean, how can you survive this way? He said to me, you know, it's been like that for some years. The pain medication don't work. There's nothing that can help. I learned to cope with it. And so we put a patch, ground, a ground his hand, put a patch on it, and waited about half an hour. And then we asked him. I, I say we because Clint was, Clint Ober was mm-hmm. there too, and we were chatting, the three of us. Uh, he said, wow. He said, interesting. It's about two or three right now. He said, nothing has done that. In fact, this, uh, this, uh, this thing, I story that I'm telling you is in the earthing book. Yep. Has been selected to be in the in the earthing book. And I was totally impressed and I was saying was, well, this is interesting. And um and we had really good results, at least as good as before. My other friends also had a great improvement and uh, and by then, you know, it took me some time, but when I'm convinced it's because I've checked this out and and uh, I made up my mind that this is for real. And since then, I became the director of the Earthing Institute in 2007. And I've seen so many cases of people being helped. So many cases, people I know, my friends, and, and all over the world. Even in Australia, there's, uh, we, had, uh, we have some people there who promote Earthing, and we have good results. And that's how I got to Earthing, because Clint showed up in my life, you know, <laughs> just like that. Yeah, that's incredible. I, I remember reading um, the book on, on our thing from, I think you co-authored that as well, right? With Clint or was that a collaboration a little bit? Um, I was, um, I did the, what is it called? The post face. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So I was kind of collaborator. I did actually revise the entire book before it was published for scientific accuracy. So make sure. Yes, that yes, okay. that's right. Yeah, and I, I read that book, I don't know, four years ago at this point, or three years ago. And yeah, it really opened my mind. And since then, I've been big on grounding. But then in the past year and a half, have taken a much deeper dive into what you say, uh, electromagnetism, quantum biology realm. And it seems to be gaining a lot of popularity and everything in this space really uh, is gaining popularity because it's very accessible to people. It's it's free, you know. It's free medicine. It's yeah. it's getting that connection back in our lives uh, yeah. when we so many people are waking up to the fact that the centralized systems of uh, healthcare, medicine, pharmaceuticals are, are really not out there to to treat people um, for a lot of the chronic diseases and chronic pain that they have. And we've talked about the benefits of grounding, but it's always great to hear from, you know, the researcher himself. And it seems like a few of the areas that, you know, maybe we could get into a little bit and on the studies you've done around like blood viscosity improvement uh, and regulating cortisol. What what to you is kind of like the most profound or what do you think is the most convincing research that that you have done? Because a lot of people like to say, you know, the research on grounding is is kind of it is what it is. It's it's not that great. The studies could be better. Obviously, there's there's limited. Uh, you know, you guys are pioneering this, and it's tough to do some of these uh, studies. But I I think some of them are, are pretty great. And you know, the for me, the blood viscosity and the cortisol rhythms are pretty undeniable evidence. Well, you hit the right 
on what I think too. I mean, for me, definitely the blood viscosity is the most convincing um, um, study for me. Uh, it's interesting because I'm learning along the way. You know, like when I graduated from polytechnic school and uh, and I was in nuclear fusion, I had no idea about you know um, the uh, the that the planet is, is a battery and that we get oh, yeah. powered uh, through the the. the, the the surface of the earth because it's a negative pole of the battery and everything. I had no idea about any of this. And I, I had no idea about blood viscosity either. I mean, I just stumbled upon a book uh, by, and it, uh, I, I don't recall the name, but we have the article, uh, the original um, information on the Earthing Institute. Uh, is It's a, ma- a man who was a specialist in rheology. So rheology is the science of colloidal solution. And a colloidal solution is a solution with solids floating in it. An example of colloidal solution is milk. Mm. That's why if it doesn't have the right pH, that's why you can take milk and put a lot of like acids like, you know, in it. And you see that the matter in it start clumping and that's how they make cheese. Mm-hmm. That is because it needs a certain pH. So, so every c- big city in, in, in the world has a rheologist part of their team because they process the sewage water. And they use for processing sewage water the principles of rheology so that they can they, they put some chemicals in it so they change the pH so that everything you know can get taken away from the water and then they process it with us, reverse osmosis, whatever other methods they do. But this guy was a rheologist who had some um, heart problem. And he understood that the blood is itself, um, you know, the colloidal solution. Just like, you know, people know about colloidal silver and things like that, you know, and that's mm-hmm. another colloidal solution. But the blood is a colloidal solution because you have the red blood cells, uh, you know, floating in there. And if the pH, you know, of your blood is not correct, what's going to happen is that, see, in a colloidal solution, all of the particles have to have a certain charge so that they repel each other. And so they stay floating in the liquid. So it's very important. So what happened, we found, is that when we're measuring the, the, the pH, uh, actually, there's a, 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 and that's something that I didn't know about, is that this person was talking about this thing called the zeta potential which is the electric potential of the particles. Um, it, it's a direct, if you will, measurements of the charge on, on the particles floating in there. So we won't get into the details of this. but So I figure out, so I said, so when I read this thing and he said, well, you know, maybe my blood is too thick. It doesn't have the right potential. So he started to change his diet, be, be more alkaline, and uh, his condition improved. So he, he was, um, I don't know exactly the, what kind of alkaline diet or things that he were doing, but he, he changed the, 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 the pH of his blood and, and, and he got better. So that gives me the idea, because you see, uh, it was a time where Dr. Sinatra was doing research on his side on, uh, with a microscope and was measuring uh, the blood, you know, of people under microscope is called light blood analysis. Mm. And he was finding that most people have actually their red blood cell clumped together, forming what they call rouleau formation, just like, mm-hmm. just like you know, a rouleau of, of, of quarters or something, just all, all together. And, 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 and when you do that, when the blood is like that, it becomes very thick and it cannot deliver oxygen because to deliver oxygen, each cell red blood cell has to pass through a capillary, which is a very the smallest blood vessels, and be squeezed in there to release its oxygen. I mean, it's very simple, actually, very mechanical. But if you have them clumped together, when they come to the small vessel, they just block it. And uh, so then you have deprivation of oxygen and then all of these, the problems that follow it. So... Um, so he was doing that, and he had some people there, and all of them have 
clogged blood, you know, like, you know, all kind of root formation or deformed cells and stuff. And he ground them, and Clint was there too. He ground them, you know, he look at them, all of them, except one person, Clint over. But Clint has been grounded and sleep grounded, and even though it was not grounded at the time, he's been grounded already for a number of years, at least 10 years. So his blood has enough charge, so he was his blood was not clumped. So he grounded people, uh, Dr. Sinatra grounded people for about, oh, I think, an hour, and then measure their blood again, and they were, you know, much better. Huge improvement. And he said, you know, we are, we, we've all thought to do a research project on that. And that's what got me, you know, looking at, you know, um, and, get, and then stumbling on, on the, this rheologist and what he was doing. And I said, I think, you know, it's much better to measure zeta potential, which is very objective measurement, versus, you know, having image of rouleau. Because I have done also rouleau formation in it checking the difference in clumping and you can count the blood cells and do something. In fact, in the article where I did with Zeta Potential, I also put that kind of, of stuff. But the Zeta Potential is much more convincing. And so, but I, I look at the time, you know, at the equipment for Zeta Potential measurement, there was nothing b- below 20,000, 30,000. Um, you know, it's, I mean, it's very simple. You know, you just put the cell into an electric field and you measure, you know, um, how fast it moves in the electric field, and then you get an idea of the charge. You know, it's just purely electric stuff. So I was able to uh, design a system that got, cost about $250 with two two gold bars, um, you know, and a slide, and, and uh, it's all in the paper. So I was very happy about that because I was able finally to replicate that zeta potential, you know, and, and show that really that, it changed the zeta potential uh, uh, quite a bit by 270%. So that means most people don't have, because they are disconnected, they, they have clog the blood, you know, that gives cardiovascular problems and all kinds of strokes and all kinds of things, you know. So um, that's a major discovery. And then we repeated that with a researcher, Richard Brown from the University of uh, Oregon in, uh, I forgot the name, it's a small town. And then we used um, uh, um, equipment that uh, that then we use uh, expensive equipment uh, we uh, were, uh, from a company that basically we had to ship bloods to that company and they were doing you know blood viscosity analysis a real blood viscosity analysis uh, using a viscometer with this these are expensive equipment. And uh, and I, it just happened that the inventor has invented this new machine that that measure blood viscosity. And you know, blood is an uh, is a very interesting um, for many reasons. One of the reason is is that it's a lo- non linear fluid. What that means is that its viscosity depends on its velocity. That's very unusual. So when you measure Really, blood viscosity, you have to measure at high shear rate and low shear rate. So that's what this company were doing. It was really pretty good stuff. So we have also two papers like that. With uh, So, I mean, there's no doubt. You know, everything is, is extremely clear. Um, I'm very, um, that, that, that to me, yeah, the measurement of the uh, blood viscosity was the, the highlight of all of that. But I want to point out also that people were claiming, yeah, we, we've done, you know, small projects. Like you were saying, you know, uh, we had limited resources. We did the best that we can. But now some doctors are starting to really pay attention. Like we have a doctor from Iran, actually, uh, who did a research on the effect of hurting on people suffering from COVID. Mm. And he took I 71, saw that. Yeah. Yeah, 71 patients. So and he uh, got good results in almost all of them. I mean, it's pretty amazing. But some of them died, you know, a couple, I think three of them died, um, but they were pretty advanced and and it helped. It helped really. So, and, and that is one thing that I want to promote and I want to put out there is that we're very open to work with researchers, you know, to get grants and get much larger projects because now we are, we're about 35 uh, research projects on our website. Most of them are peer-reviewed, 
published in, and we have about 20, 25 researchers now. So it's hard to claim that there's nothing there or it's just a few papers. And, uh, and Dr. Chevalier is the only one who did all the papers anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, it had to start somewhere, right? So it I mean, has it's to start it's somewhere. it's incredible what you've done. Unfortunately, you need what like thousands of peer-reviewed studies to convince anybody in the centralized world. And then if it's not funded by uh, yeah industry, NIH then or NIH or or someone, yeah, they'll be very skeptical. It's just crazy how that how that all works. But the way I see it, in terms of like the benefits of of grounding, I see it really in two areas. I see it's the absorption of the free electrons, which we're clearly very deficient in. And that's shown by, you know, this very coagulated, um, viscous blood that is not flowing as well as it should be. But then also there's the aspect of just being connected to the earth from say a circadian rhythm perspective. So I want to talk a little bit more about the electron flow and that's something that's really interesting because, again, it's it's very pseudoscience to a lot of people that there's free electrons at the surface of the Earth. But this is kind of a known fact from lightning strikes, from thunderstorms, and we're able to absorb that. How how is this ele- how are these electrons being transported throughout the body? Like, how is this going? And you know, this is a question I got asked on on a podcast I was on recently, and I didn't do a great job of of talking about it to be honest. But this gets into kind of the biological semiconduction. So how are we getting electrons from our feet, from our hands, to where they need to go in our body? Say the blood cell, for example. Yeah. So um, it's a, an excellent question, and it's not completely elucidated. Um, we need more experiments to do that. But I would say that the, the Jim Ashman published three very uh, interesting paper um, using, um, explaining how the electrons come inside the body. Um, so, um, and uh, he's talking about the isomiconductions uh, into the living matrix and all of these, the storage into uh, certain molecules inside the, the, the living matrix and all of that stuff. These are uh, very plausible hypotheses at this time. They have not been verified, but we do know that... Um, the best place to be grounded are the feet. And we do know that we have a meridian there called kidney, uh, the, the first kidney one point of the meridian right there in the foot. We know from Chinese medicine that the kidney meridian connect with the urinary bladder meridian and in the spine, they connect with all the other meridians of the body. So that's one route that is possible and uh, that need more research. The other one is why are the feet have more nerve endings per square centimeter than any or square inch by than any other place in the body? I mean, the feet, that sole of the feet. Okay, we need to sense, you know, um, you know, the, the, the soil when we, when we walk. Normally, that's what it was in the past. Now it's not. When shoes, you can't do that. But I wonder also if nerve conduction is not something very important. The second place where we have more nerve termination per square centimeter are the hands. I mean, these were the places where we touched the trees or, you know, like apes like people were six, seven million years ago. <laughs> I mean, they were walking barefoot and they were touching the trees or, you know, the ground all the time. And, uh, and we found also a certain number of things. Like, for example, if you ground a person, there's another paper about that that I did. Before, and a a person has inflammation in the body. We found that it takes about 20 to 30 minutes before seeing physiological changes, where the body will actually start to react to, um, you know, decrease the inflammation and things like that. So that tells us that the mechanism transport inside the body are not like, you know, a copper wire, like, you know, like, you know, a current, a DC current in a copper wire, which is... Like instantaneous speed almost yeah, yeah speed of light yep so it's very it's slow it takes 20 minutes so that's why we recommend that if you have a inflammation like for example injury of the uh, uh, shoulder and you have inflammation of the shoulder put the patch there we found that the pain can go in five minutes but if you wait and you put it under the feet it's going to take 20 to 30 minutes before you feel relief there because what the, the, it's like, you know, the electrons are provided to the body and they have to move. 
And if you have inflammation in the legs, it's going to work there first. You know, if you really want, you know, uh, uh, pain to go away, most, by the way, most pains that people have are inflammatory pain. There's two other types of pain. There's healing pain, which is good. It's going away. And there's also spasmic you know, pain when your muscle goes into spasm and then they become really uh, tight or, um, you know, they're, they're spasmic. spasmic. Um, so that, that's, but, you know, by far what people experience the most is the inflammatory pain. So, uh, and this is where earthing is excellent. excellent. So you put it, if you have a pain in the neck or even headache, Put it, put the patch there. I mean, wherever close to the region. It doesn't have to be really on it, just close by. It reminds me, you know, um, uh, Jeff Spencer, a chiropractor who was working with the athletes of the Tour de France. And when they had an injury, what was he doing? Uh, and, and you can see a video of this on our website. He put patches like this guy, he was a, a, a tremendous crash that was like several inches long so he put like six patch around it and and um the, the 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 doctor in charge of the team was about to disqualify him and and jeff said give me like 24 hours and it started healing 24 hours later he was healing enough that the surgeon said okay you can go ahead and and he continued his ride so it's pretty amazing the healing uh, that can happen when you put a patch right on a region of, of pain or injury. So I had so that's that's the reason why it's because the electrons don't flow fast and we know that. Okay. That that's cool. And and yeah, the maybe we'll have to talk to James more as well. I was really fascinated about reading that one oh, yeah. paper. And yeah. and we've talked about the collagen water matrix as well and yeah, yeah the work Robert O. Becker did proving bone is a semiconductor which is comprised of, of collagen. It's it's really fascinating. So yeah. in, in, in that area and, and these patches are they're just connected basically they're just cables you're slapping on a isol a you know, a specific area that's connected to yeah. ground, right? Yeah, yeah that's, that's it. it. It's okay. like an EKG type patch. You put it there, you connect it you connect you can connect it to a rod planted outside. Or you can use um, an uh, outlet, the ground of an outlet, after checking that it, it works properly. So um, you can use also a water pipe. You know, in many old mm -hmm. houses, they have a metal a water pipe that excellent ground. Yeah, and, and I'll, we can get into the nuance of that. But first, I wanted to talk then about the second aspect of grounding, which kind of gets into the circadian rhythm where you're just like connected to ground. So you've proven that cortisol rhythms and thus, you know, your circadian rhythm becomes more regulated when you're grounded. And, you know, my theory to that would be, yeah, if you're connected to the earth, you're getting that input signal on, you know, where you are, what time it is, what season it is through the electromagnetic communication of the earth, whether it's through the Schumann's resonance and, and other things. But I, I want to ask you to hear your opinion is, yeah, why do you think grounding and earthing is so beneficial to our circadian rhythm, why is it so great for jet lag and, and just regulating um, these cyclical rhythms in our bodies? Well, uh, we have actually clocks that internal clocks that regulates uh, all the body rhythms in our body. I mean, you have to have coordination between the digestion and the hormones and blood circulation and and uh, um, and you know, so all of these body systems have to be coordinated and and there's a clock. So the master clock is in the head <clears throat> that controls us is all these clock. Uh, and um and it's regulated also by vision, but a lot also by connection with the earth, like you were saying. So we have a number of frequencies in the earth. So the electrons are there, they're not idle, they're vibrating at different uh, um frequencies, they're all below 30 hertz, very low frequency. I mean, high frequency, like even 60 hertz, is, is strange to our body. And and I have this theory that, you know, like the Schumann resonance, for example, yes, we get it through the, the soil, but we get it, get it also to uh, the air. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all over the atmosphere. And it's it's clear. I mean, when you look at the Schumann resonance, and the different brain functions and, and the regions of 
uh, electrocardiogram, you have like, you know, the beta, alpha, theta, and delta. So the beta is the awakened state where you're most active, and it's uh, between, I think, 20 and 30 hertz. And then you have the alpha, which is when you have your eye closed and you relax. And uh, and then you have the, I think it starts at 10 hertz around there. Mm-hmm. And then you have the, sh- the, 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 the theta, uh, which is lower than that. And it just happened that the Schumann resonance is right at the cusp between alpha and theta. So it brings your brain and train your brain as this very low frequency that we're used to make us calm. Uh, I just wonder, you know, being, you know, exposed to 60 hertz or 50 hertz all day long, why people, maybe that's the reason why people are so frantic, you know. I'm the first one, <laughs> I guess the way I would say it. You know, it's like we, we need to go and do things, things and move. And I think because of the the Schumann resonance, everything helped with that because we get the Schumann resonance being grounded. But also we get other frequencies. Like, for example, the sun, you know, when the sun shines on the earth and it changes the temperature at the surface of the earth, it also gives energy to the electrons at the surface of the earth. So what happened is that and this region is limited in size. That's the region like where noon is, let's say. So you have a, a certain circle there, you know, of high energy, and then the energy is less and less going uh, on the side of that, and then and then lower. So you have like some kind of a current loop called telluric current that goes between the hot region where the sun is and the colder regions, and that creates some frequencies that are so are perceived by the body. And so the body can tell where it is on the planet when you go out, you know, like you do a trip to, uh, I don't know, Japan or something, and you put your feet on the earth. We had many testimonials. I um, just recently did um, uh, filming for a new project we have, which is a certification course for the Earthing Institute where people can come and be certified. So the lady was flying from, uh, from Chile, from uh, Santiago. And she came to San Diego. There's like four hours difference. And they put their feet on the ground. And they said, no problem. You know, there was no problem. We've seen that many, many times. So, yes. So I think, you know, it, it's another thing because it, with the, with the cortisol study, it shows that it will affect your sleep pattern. And it does, which is a big deal because how do you recover after that? You know, to recover. And then you had a I remember years ago, Going, I was in Montreal and going to Paris, France, and we took an overnight flight. So we took the the, the flight at night. You know, we had a whole day, and then the the, the night we were basically overnight uh, uh, flying above the ocean, and then coming there the early early morning. The morning started. The whole day started. We were like exhausted. It's like you know, it's like two days in one. Um, I didn't know about earthing back then, but now you know when I travel, I do the I ground, and it's it's all it's all okay. I'm sure there's a lot of more. I mean, that the moon, we know the moon influences also a lot. You know, human physiology, for example, the menstruation cycle and things like that. So all of this is included into when you have your bare foot on the ground. You like the cosmos, you know, is talking to you, telling you when you know your body, you know what time of the day it is and, and things like that. So it's, it's yeah. interesting. I think of it all as just, you know, as an engineer, it's all just input signals, right? And we want to give our body the right input signal. And, you know, you mentioned a lot of great points. And we have, yeah, the Schumann's resonance first harmonics at like 7.8 hertz. That's right in that frequency realm. That's not a mistake. 50, 60 hertz for power frequencies is probably causing some electromagnetic interference. And if you kind of understand how photons excite electrons, they also transfer the wavelength, the frequency to that electron. So to me, and what a lot of folks in the the quantum biology space think is they're pretty much just, they're quote unquote stealing electrons because we don't, we can't utilize them the same. Right, our body doesn't really know what to do with it. It's causing some sort of chaos. So my question to you then is now, you know, we have neutral uh, wires returning AC 60 hertz current to ground. We have ground rods from, from 60 hertz systems all over. 
We have just a ton of AC fields uh, from electromagnetic fields in general all over. How is this affecting grounding? Do you think like standing on the earth is uh, a lot of people argue that maybe in a very high EMF, non-native EMF, electrosmog area that it's actually not as beneficial uh, or it's maybe not even recommended. This is a very highly debated, highly controversial topic. So I'm really excited to get your opinion on it. Well, first of all, this thing about, you know, the soil being um, electrocuted or whatever, you know, having electric currents flowing through it, it's very limited in reality. Like, for example, um, I measured uh, on it in a school, actually, at California Institute of Freeman Science, where the power comes into the school and measuring the potential of different places uh, near, you know, the, the mains where the power comes in. And I found that there is difference of potential for about like 15, 20 feet around it. After that, it becomes normal. You know, Around like the main power distribution yeah. input area. Yeah. Okay. That's right. And that's the only place in the whole school where you should be careful, you know, putting a ground rod there. The other place are uh, known to have potential around them are power electric power stations. Yeah. And uh, electric train stations where the rails are also electrically um, powered. But that's very rare now. And other than that, you know, the ground is pretty much the same. The other thing that you have to watch is um, during thunderstorm. We had a lady who had a great idea to ground Earth's bed through a ground, a ground rod. rod. Yeah. And then she decided also that she would be grounded, the, grounding the feet through using a, a, what is called a bracelet, you know, at the time they had yep. a grounding yep. bracelet, and put that through the grounding system of the house yep. during oh. a, a really strong thunderstorm. And so if it was not for the fact that there was a 100 kilo ohm resistance on the, on the uh, resistor, bracelet. she would have been, yeah. She would have, yeah, well, yeah, of the bracelet. She would have been dead. I mean, uh, uh, so what happens basically is that during thunderstorm, the air potential right under the thunderstorm become really positive because of the the clouds are really high amount of electron. I mean, you can think that a a lightning is actually just a, a... a static electric discharge, just like when you walk on the carpet and you touch a, yep. a button and you have this spark. Well, imagine you have a, a spark at that, you know, a huge spark like that. That's that's exactly what lightning is. It's a transfer of electrons coming like that. And But what happened is that now you have a huge uh, difference of potential on the ground between the location of the thunderstorm, the main cloud of thunderstorm, and the surroundings, it just happened that her house was close to the, the the epicenter, if you will, of the thunderstorm. And so having two grounds, like maybe 100 feet apart, created a, a potential of about 1,000 volts that could have killed her, you know, if it was not for something. So, yeah. So we advise people when there's a thunderstorm, first, always ground on one point. <laughs> and second, in just by security, you know, don't, don't ground when during the thunderstorm. It's not a problem if you ground by one point. Are you interested in 100% grass-fed, grass-finished bison meat? I'm excited to be a partner with Falls Family Ranches. Based in Wyoming, Falls Family Ranches is raising high-quality bison meat the way nature intended. As a native large ruminant of North America, bison is one of the most nutrient-dense foods you can consume. If you're interested in trying out their bison boxes, use code TRISTAN, T-R-I-S-T-A-N, 10, for 10% off your first order. But if you do... It's because she created she created a ground loop current, right? By having those, those, exactly. those multiple ground points. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So never use multiple ground point current, you know? And, I, I, and if you don't think like, you know, you have several outlets in your house, these not different ground point because they are all connected. It's the same. Yeah, yeah. It's the same ground. Yeah. So, so that's something interesting as well because I I realize that a lot of the grounding equipment that plugs into the outlet has these this hundred kilo ohm resistor, but then, I mean, that's impeding a lot of the electrons 
that you would then absorb, right? Or at least a fair amount? Uh, actually, what we found is not a big amount. Uh, there's not much difference between 100 kilo home in, uh, in, in, uh, in where it starts to have an effect. So, we, so, so what we did is we did an experiment with uh, um, a, a very sophisticated oscilloscope. So, so we change. Uh, um, so this oscilloscope needs to be grounded to function properly. So what we did is we um, we change. We put a resistor on the ground, uh, you know, ground part of the of the connection to the to the oscilloscope. So we put like ten kilo ohm, no effect. The ground was perfect. Hundred kilo ohm was perfect. It started to malfunction at about five hundred kilo ohm. So that means that by then it doesn't receive enough electrons mm. to be considered grounded. So that's why we chose 100 kilo ohm. And all our experiments, so it seems like, um, and also we measured a body voltage, you know, another experiment we did is measure a body voltage of people who are grounded through a one mega ohm versus a 100 kilo ohm versus um, just a wire. We found that the drop in potential, you know, when you have just a wire and when you have 100 kilo ohm is almost the same. Let's say that without the wire is 100%, then uh, with uh, a wire with no resistor, if you put a uh, one kilo ohm resistor, the drop, you know, is like 98% of what it is with that. And if you use a one mega ohm, it's about 90%. So... We lose a little bit, but we've done most of our research using uh, 100 kilo ohms, you know, um, resistance, and uh, we had re- excellent results. So um, it's not linear, uh, in other terms. It's not because you have double resistance that the current that comes in decreased by a factor of two. It's not what we're seeing. Well, the way I see it is, I've kind of gone back and forth on this topic, but w- what you said makes sense. And, you know, the skin resistance itself could be what, like 10, 10 5 or, or, or yeah. 100 if it's like super yeah. dry, right? So yeah. that's a big variance in itself. And then yeah. if you just have another 100 kilo ohms in series with that, you know, it, it seems like it's, it's not a bad idea from a safety perspective, but that doesn't mean the current is it's just going to be zero either. Um, yeah. But if you have, yeah, like a, a five mega ohm resistor on there, it probably will be. So the body voltage, are you talking about the AC body voltage test yeah. that you guys yeah. do? So that's yeah. something I, I want to get into because that's something I've been testing like a lot. And okay, um, yeah, that from grounding, if you're grounded, connected to the earth, this is the way I test things. So like, do these shoes actually ground you? Um, because you'll have that induced AC voltage go to zero or, or close to zero, right? And you yeah. guys have have well, I forget who did the original uh, research study on that kind of a long time ago. The original study showing the AC, the body voltage basically goes to zero when you're when you're grounded. Um, that was uh, done. Well, well uh, could was be. that you guys or did that happen? Like I thought that happened like in the seventies or something where they proved that uh, this one guy kind of did like a at home experiment. But more importantly, the debate that comes up again is that. When you're ground, and what I'm curious on your thoughts is when you do ground this voltage, because you have this induced uh, voltage from the electric field on your body, when you ground that, are you making your body part of the circuit and then, you know, forcing know. that current through your body? or And that's then yeah. more harmful than, say, being completely insulated. I yeah. think... I'd rather have that, you know, charge dissipated completely and not having it on in in on my body all the time, uh, as and being grounded. But that's just okay. my opinion. It's just that um, the, the the most of the you know, the people who say that are electrician, and they have not studied electromagnetic fields in in depth. So, and that was what I was I was teaching electromagnetism. So what happened is uh, there's a misconception there, big misconception about what happens. It's like this, the, the same thing people said, oh, I am ground my mat and I use my EMF meter and there's more EMF coming out. That's bad. But no, it's not bad. That's also what I wanted to ask you about. So this is good. So uh, let's start with this one because it's a simpler case. Okay. So what happened is that when the mat, the mat itself 
as actually at least 100 to the home anyway. So it doesn't yes. make a b- much difference if you have it or not. So the mat itself has about the same, the same you know, 10 kilo ohm to 100 kilo ohm, depending on, um, you know, where you put your feet on. <laughs> so, you know, again, the 100 kilo ohm doesn't make a big difference there. But what happened when the mat is grounded, uh, the electric potential of the mat is forced to be at the electric potential of the earth. And actually, there's a paper about that by um, Apple White that I highly recommend. You Apple White, that's the guy. Yeah, that's what I remembered reading on the, yeah. the so AC body. So what's basically book. happened, so going to the mat, what's basically happened is that when the mat has more electrons, okay, so what these electrons do when the electromagnetic field come in? You know that by basic principle, when you have an electric field and you have a charge, the charge move along the electric field, right? Yep. So what happened is that when the, the electric field of the electromagnetic field hit the mat, then the electrons will move. They will move in such a way to create an electric field to cancel it because they have to be at the potential of the earth, you see? So what happened is that then they create another electromagnetic field around it that is reflected. So they, they take the electromagnetic field coming incident and they reflect it just like a mirror reflect light, exactly the same principle. So, but what happened now you have the incident EMF plus the reflected EMF and you measure that, there's more EMF, of course, because they are reflected, you see? There's the... The reflection, the capacity of the mat to reflect EMF increases when there's more electrons. But the body is the same. If you ground the body, you will see a current like figure four of, uh, of uh, the paper by Applewhite shows that there is a current flowing, you know? The current mimic exactly the potential change on the surface of the body because it's trying to cancel it. And people say, Oh, this current, you see there's current, it's AC current on the line and you're 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 gonna be zapped. That's that's a misconception. They don't, they don't understand that this AC current is absolutely essential so for the, the potential of the mat to be maintained at the electrical potential of the earth. Is that uh, it's a little complex to understand. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I but mean, I've I, I, I've I've, I've I've watched a lot more YouTube videos on on this topic, and yeah, there's a, it's like always a reaction or action reaction force, right? There's always a, a something trying to cancel something out, and it can get very confusing very quickly. But that 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 makes sense to me, um, and I would rather be connected and have that mitigated as, as opposed to just being induced on my body twenty four hours a day. Doctor- Dr. Andrew Doan does a really good job at showing that it's not dangerous because if you're trying to measure that current, I mean, Apple White measure it with oscilloscope, very sensitive. But if you try to measure it with a, a, a multimeter, the current is extremely small. It's not, yeah, it's not so able small. to measure. It's that extremely would, small. That's exactly what my other argument is that the current is probably, because what is it doing? It's acting as a capacitor, right? Like it's capacitive coupling. And we know that the current through capacitors is, is dependent on what the cha- rate of change of voltage and the capacitance. But that capacitor, mm. it's, got, it's like the weakest capacitor you could imagine. So the current must be really, really small. So that's, that's what I imagined as well. And, you know, there's probably well, no there's way you're measuring the that. Pa- yeah, in the paper, um, we are capacitively coupled to the wires and, and, and you, you read this model. All of this is there. But this current... Now, here's what happened, and this is research done by WHO. Uh, it's called ICNIRP, yeah, I-C-N-L-I-E-R-P, so they're the research part. They found that the uh, when you put incident EMF on the body like that, the body is able to respond up to about 100 kilohertz. If it goes faster than that, the, 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 you know, the, 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 the body is not as good a conductor as a wire. You know, a wire mm-hmm. will respond even to megahertz, even to a Wi-Fi and things like that. But the body is not able to cancel frequencies or above about 100 kilohertz. Yeah. So any frequency goes above that, they penetrate the body. And that's, why, that's where, you know, earthing, grounding uh, does not directly benefit, uh, you know, people. 
you are benefited uh, with like AC and what they call dirty electricity. All of this is below 100 kilohertz. Yeah, so power frequency. Yep. Yeah, power frequency or, you know. But if you go to Wi-Fi, um, you know, if you go to uh, cell phone and all of these frequencies that are way too high for the body to respond to. So they penetrate. So we still have to have protection. On the other hand, everything still helps at these frequencies because if they penetrate and create damage, you have uh, more energy provided to your immune system to repair the body, you see? But yeah. it's a secondary effect. So you, you still have more better. electrons. Yeah, yeah. You need that. You need more electrons to help quench the free radicals, right? Um, yeah, not only caught. that. Also, the mitochondria, you know, which are mm-hmm. the uh, powerhouse of the cells. Well, they have something essential called the electron transport chain. So you have to transport oxygen, but you have to transport electrons. Because actually, the molecule that, that is used to provide us energy is called the ATP adenosine triphosphate, actually uh, store the triphosphates. That's where the electrons, you know, that's where the energy is stored. And it yeah. stores as, as much as it stores, it stores as high electrons with high energy levels, excited state electrons. So then they, they go in the body and they give this energy, whatever is needed. You need electrons, absolutely, to get the triphosphate, the uh, ATP production. So otherwise, you're going to be fa- feeling tired, and your mi- and your repair systems will not function properly, and all of all of that stuff. That's yeah, another well, benefit. Well, that's to me, that's kind of the bigger picture, right? Is the inputs to our system are electrons and and photons, and we're getting electrons from food that we're breaking down via the TCA cycle and things like that, and then using that in the electron transport chain, and then we're also getting them from grounding and earthing. But because we're so disconnected we're, we're basically cut that source completely yeah. out of our biology and now you know if you go in the sun for far too long you know people they get headaches they can't handle it it's, they don't have enough electron they don't have enough uh, sufficient negative charge uh, to handle that kind of photonic energy so do you think do you agree with that do you think that we really should be connected 24 7 and and how are you implementing that kind of on a daily basis to be as connected as as possible to the ground to the earth you know first i agree of course um i just want to point out another source of electrons that we also are lacking in our modern life if you go back 150 years ago people were gardening and they have lettuce from their garden and tomatoes from their garden and everything was grown uh, uh, organically, because it was not it was not even questioned or something. Oh yeah, else. yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, so these fruits, vegetables, whatever, they were full of electrons. They were just now we have processed food, you know, like mm, uh, yeah, yeah. Everybody likes their their you know their um, uh, I don't know hamburger and whatever you know and apple pies and and all of these things that now we eat that have no electrons in them. They actually contribute to create more um, more stress, uh, oxidative stress in your body. So we lost two great sources yeah. of electrons, actually. So there's the food is not as electron dense, and then, yeah, it's coming along, obviously, with a whole another slew of toxins like yeah. glyphosate and uh, yeah. what have you to cause yeah. more stress. So, yeah, we're, we're burning the candle at, at all ends, uh, you yeah. could say. Yeah, and it's amazing how resilient the body is because... People normally, they start to feel that, you know, age 40, 50, 60, you know, it start to break down. I mean, it's like the body, that's another thing also that we haven't talked about, is that the body is a bioelectrical system. So that means that just like any electrical system, it needs uh, potential reference points, right? I mean, you have an amplifier and it has to have, you know, a high potential, low potential to mm-hmm. function properly, right? Well... What happened when you're not grounded? You lost your main point of, you know, of uh, reference. Uh, reference. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So now what the body does is virtual reference here and there, you know, and trying to cope. And it's it's good. It's doing that for 40, 50 years. But at some point, it doesn't work. And what happens is the immune system use these reference, electrical reference point to determine what's, what's you and what's not you. Now it doesn't know. 
So I see something strange and start attacking it, start attacking. So you get autoimmune diseases, including like diabetes and uh, lupus and all of these things. It's because the immune system says, this is the enemy. Let's attack it. Doesn't know anything because there's no reference point. So that's it's another chaos. way it's of chaos. looking at this. Yeah. It's chaos. It, yeah. The, the way I see it too is like the signal to noise ratio is, is, is lower than ever because there's so much static on the line. There's no it's, reference. A, there's yeah. just miscommunication uh, everywhere in our biology from a, lo- a lot of it is is from, you know, insufficient inputs and then the wrong types and then the EMFs causing really just a whole lot of confusion. So I guess on that point, you know, do you think that the advent of yeah RF and 4G, 3G, 4G, 5G is, is really causing like huge issues because our body is even less equipped to handle these these higher frequencies? Yeah, uh, uh, ungrounded people, you know, yeah, it's more and it, it creates imbalance. If you are grounded all the time and um, and you have, you know, like your cell phone and things and you, you are careful. So, for example, my cell phone, I always put it on uh, speaker Airplane. mode. Oh, uh, speaker, yeah, yeah. Speaker moan, you know, I'm always keeping it away. I found some research that I've done shows that actually some some companies make some products that actually work. You know what? One in a hundred, because I'm also director of SciTech Labs, director of research at SciTech Labs, and I've tested a lot of these products. How Only do you test how do 100. you test them? How do you test that they actually okay. work? Because I I get questions like this all the time. And most of the studies, I you know, harmonizers, I, I, I just can't, I, I, there's no, no proof, really. So no, I say like no. No, it's like use muscle testing, say, well, yeah, let's see. Let's yeah, see. yeah, yeah. So I always say steer clear. If you want to spend $20 on something, then, you know, it's $20 and make you feel better. That's fine. But don't spend $1,000 on something. Go turn, yeah. buy, a, buy a switch for your Wi-Fi or, or your circuit or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing is that, you know, even a, the thin aluminum foil, as thin as it is, will block these EMFs. So it's easy, actually. You wrap your cell phone in, in you know, yeah. foil or you. Fair, you Faraday cages work, right? We we know that's that. Right. That's right. So, but you to um, let's see, where were we? To get back to your um, other point, which was uh, um, just like, what are you testing? Sorry for these products. Okay, how do I um, test? Them? Yeah. So yeah, um, yeah. Um, so I've done research also on, you know, uh, different uh, equipment for also, and I've, even before, you know, see, when, when I was at CIHS, I was director of research there. We were testing all kinds of interesting devices, like Dr. Mutima had made a device to measure the flow of chi in the meridians, and, and we had also a device from uh, Russia called the Gas Discharge Visualization They've done a lot of research on Kirlian photography. Have you heard of that? Kirlian no, I haven't. Photography? No. It's very interesting. Kirlian photography, uh, first Kirlian is a, a Russian couple. And so they discovered that it, they can put like, they cut a leaf, then put it on a photographic plate. So you can see a photo of the leaf. So what they did after that is that they placed the leaf on a high potential high potential, they ground the leaf and they put the high potential between the, 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 the leaf and a, a plate on top of it. And so then, then they record the uh, basically the, the glow, which is the, uh, the um, corona discharge around it. What they found is that by cutting a piece of the leaf, they could still see the corona discharge of the whole leaf. So, it, so this has been difficult to be replicated, but the Russians... I've done lots of research on, on that. They even made an institute on that. And they, the, and then there's a researcher, his name is Konstantin Korotkov, found a way to use it with human beings. And uh, he made a, a machine called a GDV gas discharge visualization. So basically, we measure some kind of a component of the biofield or bioenergy of the body that is not purely electrical. Only. True electrical means we're measuring something a little more than that. And it's so fascinating. Uh, and just like Motoyama's machine also measures some kind of electrical correlates of some of the chi. And the interesting thing is that these two machines, based on totally different principles, they actually correlate with each other. So that means they come to the same conclusion. 
So we use this GDV to measure the energy field of a person. So we have this person alone, and we measure the energy field of the person. And then we have the person um, hold the phone and uh, when it is activated you yeah. know, for five minutes. I mean, you don't need much. Five minutes is enough to disturb That's your a energy lot. field. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it disturbs your energy field a lot. So, and then after that, we have the person take the phone, use the product, put them on the phone or on them or whatever that is supposed, the way they're saying it's supposed to work. Then we measure the energy field of the person. And most of the time, no change is out of whack, just like it was without it. But a few products actually get the energy back to normal. And it's not only one company, but there's a few companies. Actually, there's only three out of all of those. I think two or three that actually get something that works. And it's not, that's the, the strange thing. It's not that the ones that are more, um, like, for example, there was one made by Dr. Bill Tiller, which seems reasonable. Like you have a pendant that will generate uh, uh, Schumann resonance on your body that will be strong enough to prevent, you know, the other ones, the high frequency EMF from basically taking control of your of your charges inside the body because that's what happened. Your body functions cannot function properly because the EMF penetrate your body and basically change the way the electrons and the other charge in your body are are working are supposed to work. So he made it. The idea is less. Probably it's not enough. I think the idea there's some merit, but the pendant did not. So, did so not if you have this pendant that's generating, let's say, eight hertz field, that's more natural. It's the Schumann's resonance frequency. You're basically saying that that's kind of what is dictating our biology, and that's you know in close proximity and high intensity. So if we get blasted by 2.4 gigahertz from Wi-Fi or something, it's not. There's not going to be. Not as bad. Root, it's not as bad. It's not yeah, as bad. There's not going to be a, any as electrons left to excite or I, i'm just trying to think so, of how so that exactly it, works really so the, the way it works is that the electrons will will respond to the strongest field yes yes so if you make if you have wi-fi coming in and it's pretty weak you can theoretically generate around you or with some device um, another e electromagnetic field uh at 7.8 hertz that overpowers the other one. Mm. So the electrons will respond to that one, which is more natural. Yeah. So there should, there should be benefits in doing that. And I think there are um, some people doing it, but I have not measured any device uh, working on that principle that works at, the, at okay. this time. At this time. So the, the, the ones, ones that, that are, do work, yeah, the ones that do work from what you have measured, what what kind of, you know, what are they implementing? Are they like gold or copper? No. Or, or no. they just, it's, or you um, don't even know? I, was, <laughs> I, do, I, I, I know that they use sacred geometry. Yes. Okay. Okay. But I don't understand how they work. I do have an idea because of the research done by Dr. <clears throat> Elizabeth Rauch about the fact that our electromagnetic equation, um, you know, <clears throat> I don't know if we should get into this, but we're missing a component in our, mm. so now the, you know, the electromagnetic field are transverse, transverse fields. So that means field that are perpendicular in yeah. the, to the direction. But there was a longitudinal field. And I yeah. think that's the secrets of Tesla because yeah. that longitudinal field works like what they call I think um what they call that now just scalar uh, scalar waves exactly yeah. scalar waves and I think that's the secret that the only explanation I could find is that those sacred geometry are able because if you measure it doesn't stop the electric at all no. but it must change something probably making a more longitudinal version you know changing the ratio of transverse to the longitudinal waves, and that creates uh, some kind of a, a, a scalar field that actually is beneficial for the human being. So I think yeah. there's some ways in the future that we have all the technology we have, but instead of being harmful, it would be beneficial. Uh, this yeah. should be a high priority research, but nobody's doing it. Yeah. So 
I want to say this. I, I always recommend to people that to, they be very skeptical of pendants, harmonizers, crystals, anything. But then I also say there is a chance that some of these could work that we just actually don't even know how they work at all. And that you can't really tell, you can't really prove it. So again, you're taking like a gamble. And if you're spending hundreds of dollars or even a thousand plus dollars, you're gambling with your money on whether it'll work. But placebo effect is real. However, yeah. I have I have interviewed someone yeah. who is a scalar wave practitioner and he has his own Tesla coil. And it was, you know, again, this topic is very controversial. It's it's very thought provoking. But we know that, yeah, Tesla was able to do some some really cool stuff uh, transmitting wireless energy. And, and basically he explained Tom Palladino that scalar waves are, are a higher energy level than electromagnetic waves. And that's the that's the highest source. And and again, you still get all the ba- the main benefits by going outside, being connected. He recommends all the same things, but he's saying he's like, you know, this has been suppressed for a really long time because it could really flip the world upside down. And perhaps now that I've thought about the yeah, the sacred geometry, the pyramids, ancient civilizations, you can get into all this stuff. Yeah. And a lot of people think it's it's the scalar scalar technology, scalar waves that are more longitudinal in nature. And yeah, so I always leave that door open. And I guess if you test something and it works, it works. We should do more research. We should do more research in that. And Elizabeth Rasher has a book called uh, Orbiting the Seven Moon of Pluto, strange name, but she lay out all the, um, the, uh, the, um, the mathematics of quarter neon that were used actually by Maxwell when he did this mm. equation. He had four variables, not three. Three of space, one of, of, of time. Now, um, somebody named Heaviside just dropped the, 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 the longitudinal one saying, oh, we don't need it. But, but I think we do. <laughs> there's, there's more there. I mean, there's so much more, right? Like, you know, yeah. everything that kind of they had an inkling of thought around in the 20th century just got so suppressed. So I'm curious, you know, just wrapping up here is how, how is it going with like the research in general? Is this like, I'd imagine it's a pretty big struggle to get funding. Um, how is CIHS going forward? What can people do to help out? What, what needs to happen basically for there to be more emphasis, more money available to research things that matter in this quantum realm, this alternative realm that is uh, completely outside the centralized dogma that is, you know, healthcare and academia. It's a very good question. This is a hundred thousand dollar question. Uh, we know that the, the the NIH has now the NC. What is it called? NCI. CH, which is the National Center for the Study of Integrative Medicine. So mm-hmm. they have a budget there. Um, the the person in charge, uh, her name is Langevin. Langevin. She's, uh, free, she's from uh, Quebec also, just like me. So we met years ago. She used to be uh, doing research in acupuncture. So there might be an opening there, you know, if uh, researchers, um, you know, a number of researchers group together and we're trying to do that, but it's been difficult because the researchers currently doing research in medical field um, have other projects. That's why they are researchers, and they get grants, and they have deadlines, and they are busy. And it's very difficult to find somebody who will even take the time, you know, to um, to uh, sit with us and write, you know, a, propo- a multi-center proposal. That's what we need at the moment, um, but. Um, I think it's going to happen because that's why we, we need to spread the word. We need to, yep. we're trying, uh, that's why we do like the uh, earthing certification course because the health practitioners said, you know, we have certificate in nutrition, in acupuncture, in, you know, a bunch of things. And it, if you give, if you do a certification in uh, earthing from the earthing institute, that will give us more uh, credibility, you know, towards yep. the population to, you know, tell them the benefits of everything and, and spread the words. So this movement, uh, this project is actually driven by the, 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 the health practitioners who really believe in everything. So there's uh, lots of them. In fact, uh, the input came from uh, South America, actually. 
a lady who is a distributor of printing products in South America came to us and said, yeah, we have people who want that. So this is nice because we just did it with her. Um, so, um, so we team up so that w- both we can have, you know, the one thing that they didn't want is to have me alone doing it. You know, there, there, there's so many women that are actually, actually the, you know, that, uh, there's more women intuitively. I'm sorry to say that, but this is what we found by, um, you know, according to the earthing.com website, uh, the Clint Ober company, there's more women buying earthing products. It seems that more women feel intuitively that, that it has I think they're more sense. open. Yeah, they're more open to these, I don't know, more esoteric health I guess. So, um, benefits. Uh, so I, I, I think it, men, men can be pretty stubborn sometimes. Uh, we <laughs> are. You know, it's like it's like me, you know, I'm the first one. You know, it's like, what? hundred yep. years ago should have been said, well, it's too simple. You know, <laughs> it's like we have this bi- scientific bias that everything simple has been discovered. You know? Now we have to go to complex stuff and you need the differential equation you know, and all of that stuff. Be able to solve the most simple problem. But that's not true. That's not true. That's what I'm finding, um, um, which is a humbling experience. And um, I think our scientists should should think about that. But anyway, that's me. Well, it's, it seems like we need to, yeah, create, and what I'm trying to do is spread this education, but the, yeah, create some excitement and momentum around it. Because if you do, yeah. you know, say you have someone coming out of university, out of college, who is maybe like, if I was still in college, for example, and I wanted to pursue a STEM degree and be a researcher, I would be excited about grounding and earthing and electromagnetic aspects of our biology. And I would want to research that. So I think it comes from from that passion as well. So that's why spreading the message is really important. And then whatever works, right? Like if truth, truth will resonate if it's allowed to, you know, spread. And I think the more people who realize that they can get just as much benefit from a free modality that's accessible to them as one that costs a lot of money and lines the pockets of of other folks, then they're going to gravitate towards it. It might take time. There's going to be a big hurdles to overcome with the uh, skeptical, you know, narratives uh, and biased narratives. But I think that that is the key. And that's so great. I think the certification is is a fantastic idea as well. We're seeing that more with like quantum biology certifications, EMF courses and, and certifications. I, I think it all has a place. Uh, yeah. Definitely. Can well, I fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Can I just say something? Yeah, yeah. We're not discouraged because it's been about 20 years now. Um, there was a case of a doctor at the uh, in the 19th, second part of the 19th century. You know, lots of women was uh, were um, uh, dying after giving birth. And the doctors at the time, uh, they could work on a, a, a dead a cadaver, you know, and then deliver the baby. And they didn't know anything about, you know, uh, hygiene that we know today. So one doctor figured out that maybe that we're transferring some kind of, uh, you know, bugs or something. So he said, well, what is I simple thing? I'm washing my hands. And, and he found out that the women were, you know, surviving much more. So he started talking about this idea to this doctor. He was laughed out so much. And he was oh, ridiculed yeah. so much that he ended up, you know, insane in an in asylum. Mm-hmm. It's only about 20, 25 years later that uh, a renowned doctor retook his idea, tried for himself, and published papers about it. And finally, it was accepted. 25 years. So we're at 20 years. So we still have hope. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that same story before, actually, and it, it, it it's crazy, right? But that's with anything, right? Anytime there's something that is completely innovative, I mean, automobiles, the internet, laptops, right? You've, people are like, oh, that's never going to catch on. You know, we're just all going to ride horses forever. That it, it takes a long time. So Disruptive technologies, they call that now. Yeah, even though we're, the, this isn't a disruptive technology. This is the most primitive uh, yeah. ancestral uh, habit and technology and it's it's yeah it's liberating right i think and that's what decentralization is all about because you can take control of your life if, if you yeah. understand that these modalities actually work yeah. so thank you so much guys this has been a lot of fun um thank you. I learned a Enjoy ton and i hope our listeners did as well where can mm-hmm. folks find out more about your work the earthing institute yeah. and anything else 
So the best way to connect with me and to find information is to go to the earth, earthinginstitute.net. So it's, uh, I don't know if you can put it um, somewhere. Oh yeah, we'll put it in the show notes. Earthinginstitute.net. And if you have questions uh, or you want, you know, to thinking about doing research, we have many graduate students who want to actually do research on earthing, but they, they get roadblocks from their advisors as well, you know, it's not. So there, there's been some some roadblocks, but but it's happening. So EarthingInstitute.net is the best way, and um, there's a place where you can put comments, or you can actually we have uh, I receive you know you can uh, put information there, and and I receive it. And if you want to connect with me, um, that's uh, the the best way to go. You can also uh, email directly at info at EarthingInstitute.net. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate your time. And and thanks, everybody, for listening in to another episode of Decentralized Radio. We'll see you next time. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it.